Moin aus Hamburg, dear ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the International Advanced Press Conference for SMM, the leading maritime trade fair. Thank you for joining us online. It's great to see that many journalists from all around the world are here with us today. My name is David Patrician, and I will guide you through this press conference, which will feature a 60 to 70 minute panel discussion, followed by a Q&A session at the end. You can enter your questions via the chat you see on your screen. Please also send your name, news outlet, and the name of the expert you're directing it to. If your questions can't be answered live due to our time frame, Nora Hirschfeld, Press Officer SMM, will get back to you after the press conference via email individually. Thank you for your understanding. And just a reminder, we are recording this live press conference so that you and those who can't participate will be able to review it on the SMM website afterwards. Now, I'd like to welcome today's experts for the press conference, which represents several industries in the maritime market. Christina Alexandri, co-founder and chief operating officer at Bound for Blue. She says that the pandemic has pushed forward the sustainability issue for the market and increased the demand for green solutions like wind propulsion systems. The maritime industry should talk about the energy problem, not only about alternative fuels. Nicholas Schuss, President-designate BIMCO, the Baltic and International Maritime Council, and CEO Reederei Leitz. Nicholas Schuss says decarbonization is the number one topic in the shipping industry, but practical and realistic solutions are still missing and are much needed. And he adds, as a globally regulated industry, shipping is ideally positioned to become green via a carbon pricing system. Knut Orbeck Nielsen, Chief Executive Officer, DNV Maritime. CEO of DNV Maritime, Knut Orbeck Nielsen believes we are on the cusp of a maritime renaissance powered by innovation and collaboration, which he regards as the real fuel of the future. Reflecting on the fuel transition ahead, he also believes that we should keep an open mind to all fuels and technologies, and that safety in people must lie at the heart of all decision-making concerning green shipping and greener shipping. Professor Dr. Martin Stupford, maritime economist. This maritime expert is concerned that shipping will have difficulty obtaining timely supplies of green fuel and managing the big changes that lie ahead. Rene Berkvins, chair, C Europe, and former CEO of the Daman Group. He calls for quick and powerful means to support the European shipbuilding and manufacturing industry in order to keep its leading position when it comes to innovative technologies and research. He says the technology is there. Now it is time to invest. And last, but definitely not least, Bernd Aufterheide, CEO of Hamburg Messe und Congress, who will now give a few opening words. So even if we're at home or in our offices, let's give a warm round of applause for Bernd Aufterheide. Bernd, the stage is yours. Welcome, sir. Thank you, David. Please. Thank you very much. So ladies and gentlemen, international media representatives, thank you for joining us uh, this live stream of our SMM Advanced Press Conference. I'm pleased to present to you a panel of top flight experts who will shortly share their thoughts about the key topics on the maritime agenda. The same topics will be in focus at SMM in September. But let me begin by addressing the current situation, which is one all of us uh, have, on our, have on our minds. There is war in Europe. Just a few months ago, we were all hoping after two years of ups and downs between COVID lockdowns and reopening, that we would soon be able to start looking ahead with confidence again. Now something has caught up with us that would have seemed more appropriate during the past century, at least here in Europe. Our compassion is with all those who are suffering. We condemn the Russian aggression. In our thoughts, we are with the countless humans in Ukraine who are exposed to unimaginable misery, witnessing the destruction of their homeland. The COVID pand pandemic, ladies and gentlemen, is not behind us yet. The war is another heavy blow for the global economy, and that includes international shipping, logistic chains, and ports. Around 100 merchant vessels are stuck in the Black Sea at the moment. Their crews have no idea when the situation might be safe enough to continue their voyages. Parts of the sea region are full of mines. The port city of Mariupol is destroyed, and Odessa is again the focus of massive Russian attacks. 
Nearly 14% of the crews of the global merchant fleet are Russian and Ukrainian seafarers, many of them officers. Members of both nations often work side by side on board the same ship and have to cope with this difficult situation now. Many Ukrainians have returned home to defend their homeland. And at the same time, shipping companies are doing everything they can do to take seafarers and their families to safety. And while many shipping companies now avoid calling it Ukrainian ports for safety reasons, Russian ports are completely off limits because of the sanctions. Many terminals around the world are refusing to process containers coming from or destined for Russia. Similar to the pandemic, this war is making us see once again how closely the world is interconnected and how vulnerable supply chains are. We can see it in the current flare-up of the coronavirus, uh, coronavirus crisis in China. The strict lockdown in Shanghai is causing backups at the world's biggest container terminal, and the consequences are felt in every part of the world. Huge quantities of goods and key components cannot be delivered or arrive with delays. Some industries are no longer able to compensate for that. And I'm sure our guests will illustrate further what all this means for the supply chain in the maritime industry. The Ukraine war is forcing Europe to rid itself of the dependency on Russian energy supplies. And this makes it even more urgent to say farewell to fossil fuels now, a goal the world has been pursuing for some time to combat climate change. Our planet's atmosphere continues to heat up, posing the most existential challenge to mankind yet, although the pandemic and the war seem to have moved the climate crisis off focus. This brings us to the main topic of this year's SMM agenda, driving the maritime transition. This motto points the way towards carbon neutral shipping. The industry itself has chosen this goal. The open question remains how it can be reached, and time is short. If we want 60,000 ships to be crossing the world's oceans by 2050 without damaging the climate, we must invest now. SMM and the expert conferences accompanying the fair will mainly focus on the question what fuels the shipping industry can use to decarbonize. Whether it will be a synthetic natural gas, methanol or ammonia, one thing is clear. Green hydrogen will play a key role as a basic substance and it will be a key topic at SMM. For example, it will be addressed by one of the discussion panels at GMAC, the Global Maritime Environmental Conference, which will include the maritime coordinator of the Ger German federal government, Mrs. Claudia Müller, and Kita Klim, the secretary general of the IMO. Of course, it makes perfect sense that we, as Hamburg Messe, will be able to further explore this topic at Wind Energy Hamburg and the H2 Expo conference right after SMM. For more on this, please attend the press conference of our colleagues at 2 p.m. Apart from the transition to alternative energy sources, the SMM motto, Driving the Maritime Transition, addresses an additional important aspect, digitalization, which can make a contribution for its own to climate neutrality. Digitalization is about using smart software, artificial intelligence and big data to achieve efficiency gains and thereby minimize the consumption of resources. So in September, following a virtualized interlude in early 2021, we are finally ready to launch the 30th edition of SMM after a four years wait. We are expecting around 2,000 exhibitors from over 100 countries who will showcase their innovations for a digitalized, emission-free shipping future to about 40,000 industry visitors from around the world. Participants can expect an expiring mix of market-leading and startup companies and a unique opportunity to engage in insightful conversations and productive networking. We have developed several new features for the leading international maritime fair to intensify the exchange of ideas and knowledge between stakeholders and to enhance the benefits for everybody. For example, we are setting up the new transition stage to provide exhibitor representatives and other experts with opportunities to highlight their perspectives on the key topics of this SMM. Furthermore, we are including major customers of logistics providers to add their views. And public discussion with climate protection activists will demonstrate that as an industry, we are willing to look beyond the tips of our noses. So ladies and gentlemen, dear panelists, I very much hope that we will soon look back on the war and uh, the pandemic as a matters of the past. And I'm looking forward to welcome you, to welcoming the maritime community to SMM in September. There is one thing the past few years have made abundantly clear. Nothing can replace the personal contact between industry players and other stakeholders. 
It takes these direct personal conversations to move things along. And now I'm eager to listen to the ideas and knowledge of our panel experts will share with us. Thank you very much for your attention. Super. Thank you very much, Bernd, for those opening remarks. And I think now I'd invite you also to take a seat and we'll begin our discussion in a moment here. It is certainly a great honor and a pleasure to be able to moderate this distinguished uh, panel today. And before I begin, I just wanted to remind everyone, in our preparations for this discussion, we realized we could really talk for hours and hours with these distinguished guests, and unfortunately we only have a limited amount of time. So uh, I will try to make sure we keep in our time, uh, time limits and that everyone has equal amounts of time to speak. I'd like to begin with Martin. Martin, if you may, I'm opening this panel by a quotation of yours, and we discussed this also earlier today. You had said that the shipping and shipbuilding industries are moving into an era of change. Nothing like this since containerization, which happened in the 1960s, and even steam, which we had a century earlier. The three main components, climate change, digital innovation, and geopolitical developments, mean that maritime companies cannot expect business as usual. The pace of change is pressing, but it cannot happen overnight. Developing the right strategy is more important than a quick response." End of quote. So Martin, let's begin, and let's talk about the shipping industry. How is it doing these days? Oh, thanks, Peter. Um, I guess it's a sort of best of times, worst of times scenario. You know, that famous quote from Charles Dickens in A Tale of Two Cities. Um, uh, it's worth reading the rest of it, actually. But um, the shipping industry had a great year this year. They've made money. If the Clarkson <laughs> Index, which is, gives an average of tankers, bulk carriers, container ships, and gas, um, averaged about $40,000 a day, which compares with the last seven or eight years when it's been wandering along between ten and $15,000 a day. So there's money come in this year. It's quite recent. Financial debt's not that strong at the moment. Um, and the, 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 I think what's worrying a lot of people is where you go next, because the, the world economy has bounced back very well from the cycle. Um, industry went down 5% in 2020. It's come back up. We're, we're moving ahead there. But there's a bunch of things out there which really, I think, make everybody feel rather uncomfortable. And I think that reflects in the activities of the ship owners, both an investment and um, uh, and the shipbuilders in terms of their order books. Um, the, the I'll just briefly mention one or two, if please, I may, and please, then absolutely. I'll, I'll carry on. Well, uh, I think the, the the step backwards in the lockdown in China is is very is probably quite good because that's going to upset the logistics a bit more, and the industry's done well out of that. Um, energy prices, um, gas, and oil. They, last time this happened, which was about 1979, um, it had a very acute deflationary effect on the economy and it triggered some economic developments which gave us a very nasty recession in the, the 1980s. And I think there's a concern that inflation is now going up. We've got the, the states almost into double digits. Mm. and. Interest rates are going up, and in fact, in, in March, the Fed uh, announced that they were going to go in for quantitative tightening, the opposite of quantitative easing. And so they're going to take a trillion dollars out of their treasuries portfolio in the, in the next year. And this is, you know, this is all discouraging, <coughs> frankly. Uh, but for the time being, they're making money. And uh, I think, um, you know, a dollar in the bank's a dollar in the bank, Peter. I'm going to leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Challenging times, but there is profit to be made. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> well, I'd like to turn it over now. And before I begin, one important note, if I may, and that is that um, Martin has published many things, but you have a recent paper, and we can find more information about that and about our entire press conference on the SMM homepage. And we'll put that up after the press conference. So I just wanted to remind everyone about that. Um, I'd like to turn it over to, to Nico, and I'd like to ask him to comment on what Martin said. And before that, also, just a reminder to our, to our audience, you are with BIMCO, and BIMCO's mission is, and I have the quote here, to be at the forefront of global developments in shipping, providing expert knowledge and practical advice to safeguard and add value to members' businesses. And as we all know, global developments couldn't be more challenging during these times. So what are your main topics or concerns these days, please? Thank you, David. 
there, there are many topics that, that were touched by Martin. Um, of course, for the Ukraine, we, we hope for a return to the better as, as soon as possible. Digitalization, um, Corona, market developments. The, the elephant in the room really is decarbonization. Um, and that is not about greenwashing. That, that, that is about finding the right path to do the right thing. Um, as, as you say, BIMCO is the practical voice of shipping. And the most important role for BIMCO in this transition period will be to find an alignment between the understandable requirements of the regulators and the necessities of the industry. Um, th these are mainly to ensure that we have um, a competitive playing field in level playing field in the shipping, in the global shipping industry. Are you optimistic uh, that that is going to happen in the next couple of years? Let me come back to that in Please. one minute. Sure. Um, we don't want distortion of competition. We want the, regulata uh, the, the, the regulatory requirements to be practical. We want small organizations to be able to implement them. We want that the requirements are measurable and implementable. So um, that, that will be the main aim of BEMCO to do that. The second main aim will be that, it, that we have global uh, uh, regulation. That will be difficult. Mm. And uh, one thing we are going to propose is that IMO at least tries to phrase a framework for regional regulation. And if we achieve that, I think there is a lot to be done to keep the level playing field. Excellent. Thank you very much. Good. There's optimistic news there then. Knut, I want to turn over to you. Um, how do you evaluate the current situation of the maritime industry? What are the main challenges and obstacles of your clients these days? Thank you, David. It's, it's always difficult to come after Martin and Nico and add <laughs> uh, some more context to this. But uh, I would say that <laughs> the world is uh, in transition. It's transforming. And so is the maritime and the shipping industries. And there are really three tectonic shifts that are influencing the industry right now. It's uh, the, say, the unpredictable markets that have, we have seen for several years. It's uh, together with the political shocks that Bernd uh, referred to as one example. But it's also how decarbonization is really setting the agenda together with the ESG revolution. And uh, the third point, the, the third tectonic shift is really around technology, typically fuels, digitalization, propulsion, etc. So um, it's really difficult for the maritime community to make the right strategies. And in a, in a period of, of great uncertainty that we, we have now, it's, uh, it's difficult to know whether you should be a first mover, a second follower, or maybe even delay everything. Uh, so in this context, I, I usually try to emphasize that it's really important that we as an industry also look beyond the maritime industry. We are very much depending on the energy producers, the, the companies and the infrastructures that will be available to us and, and the port facilities, etc. Mm -hmm. So this is really a time for collaboration. And that's where, uh, you know, the, the role of BIMCO, the role of the IMO, the role of organizations really plays a, a significant and important role. And, and this challenge that we're up against is bigger than anyone can solve on its own. Yeah. And that's why uh, collaboration uh, and coming together to s try and resolve this grand challenge over time is really important. So I can put you on the spot for a moment because we do have a lot of organizations in the maritime industry. How do you feel the intercommunication, the communication between the organizations is now? It's, it's maybe a general question, but does that need to be improved on that the actual uh, organizations like IMO, uh, BIMCO, all these groups can talk better with each other? Well, uh, I think there is a lot of dialogue going on and, uh, and that is really uh, helpful. And naturally, there are many different viewpoints and agendas, so it, it's not an easy dialogue. 
Uh, but what we've seen lately is also the formation of, of decarbonization centers, like the one we have in Copenhagen with the Merck McKinley Center, yeah. but also the one in, in Singapore, the Global Center for Maritime Decarbonization. And these are inis initiatives that came up very recently, and it goes to show with the great support from industry and these hubs reaching out wider that there is really a willingness to collaborate and and put our efforts and our knowledge and experience together to resolve this so right. i think we're on a good path but it's <laughs> naturally the work is ahead of us and action is what is needed fantastic thank you very much let me turn our discussion back to martin real quick then martin how does the shipbuilding sector look like in general oh well um china's uh I pretty, pretty well consolidated as the biggest guy now. They've got 40% of the, um, the, 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 the deliveries at the moment. Um, Korea's behind, uh, just behind them with 30%. And uh, c Japan's holding up very well on about 15 to 20%, which, given their long history, is, is a very good achievement. So I think you know, they, they must feel comfortable that they've got through this very nasty period when there was not many orders about at all, with a bit of help from governments and so forth. And um, uh, looking ahead, they, uh, c they've managed to push the prices up. I mean, the prices are up over 20% in the last 12 months. And th I think they're really um, uh, you know, balancing a tight order book. It's only 9.7% of the fleet. Uh, sorry to quote all these numbers, but you know, 9.7% of the fleet is not a lot of work for shipyards. It's maybe uh, this year, next, most of next year, but it's not one of these big order books you've had in the past. Mm. And um, I think the, the strange issue here is that the, although the container guys have been very willing to order and their, um, you know, their order books are up 26%, um, in the last, always is up to 26% of the fleet on order, whereas the tankers and bulkers are down to 6%. Mm. So, you know, the, the guys in the bulk sector talk, picking up the, about the technology points that Nico and uh, Newt talked about, they, you know, this, people are sitting on their hands a little bit in the bulk sector, and I can well understand it because I totally agree with what's been said. This is, it's a sort of, you know, what do you order? Uh, maybe maybe Rene knows the answer to that one. <laughs> I do have a question for Rene, but if you want to reply to that, would you like to say anything to that, Rene? No, no, no. I, 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 um, I'll, I I'll take that joking. question first and then, <laughs> and then bring it in. Fair enough. Okay. <laughs> Very good. Then I'll continue. So, Rene, the question I had prepared for you here, uh, and Martin just mentioned uh, the situation in China, and China and Korea are <coughs> successful in the mass market of building <laughs> container ships, bulkers, and tankers. And this is also the result, I think many of us know, of an unfair competition because the Chinese and Korean governments have supported their own shipbuilding industry massively. So since the technologies may become more sophisticated, the question I have, can you imagine that parts of the market come back to Europe and do you require support by the EU institutions? That's a mouthful, uh, David. <laughs> Thank you <laughs> not, very not much. Easy, it's not a easy. difficult question, but uh, uh, let, me, let me give it a try. Please. Um, I think finally the, uh, the EU, the European Union, uh, admitted after 30 years that there is an unlevel playing field in, in the maritime, at least in the maritime uh, construction industry. Um, having said that, so they concluded that about a year or two ago, uh, but having said that, you know, they have not proposed any solution to that, so we are basically stuck. Mm. Uh, where we have been for the 30 for the past 30 years and where is that o of course you know the uh, if, if you look at 50 60 years of uh, of shipbuilding world shipbuilding that shift as martin just explained uh the big ships left to be built in in asia um but what is still left in europe is a very uh, healthy uh shipbuilding and particularly maritime equipment industry you know we're still talking about an industry employing more than a million people in europe uh, with a turnover of about 125 billion uh, uh, euros so it's not by any means not nothing um what i think uh you know what what we have been asking what we will continue to ask is for a level playing field now 
um, I'm an optimist, <laughs> and uh, you know, I'd like to combine that with, with the, 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 the things that, that have been mentioned here be, uh, just now, which is, of course, decarbonization being the big issue, and what can we, uh, as a maritime manufacturing industry, contribute to that? And I think we have a lot to contribute. You know, I think Europe is still leading in terms of innovation uh, for the maritime industry. Um, so so uh, uh, th th that is positive and, and that's why we, you know, s we are extremely positive about the Fit for 55, the Green Deal, the European Green Deal, because we believe it, it will ignite um, uh, a lot of positive developments uh, not only, uh, you know, of course, for decarbonization, mm. but it will also uh, ignite uh, new business opportunities. And in fact, interestingly enough, uh, the EU is going to spend a lot of money on on the subject, on the Green Deal, with also with the idea that it it is o that it will also provide a business case for for European companies, and in this particular case, of course, for European maritime companies. And uh, and then the now coming back to your question. You know, is wh what are you going to do? Are you going to subsidize or to spend a lot of money in R D and I in Europe on on European companies and then let the business go to Asia? Yes or no? Mm. Well, you know, obviously we are trying to at least protect a market uh, in Europe th that is strategic for for Europe. You know, it, it uh, we uh, uh, and that's also what the E U is thinking and saying. Uh, that you know, we should that that the the ship shipping and shipbuilding uh, uh, industry is a strategic industry mm -hmm. and should stay in Europe for at least to service the European uh, the European market. And that is not only cargo ships, right? I mean, that's including military, fishing, uh, defense and security, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that 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 I think is uh, uh, is what is to be defended here. Uh, uh, but on the whole, I'm positive. You know, if I look uh, for the next uh, uh, couple of decennia, I think you know, um, uh, in the end, we will we will reach the targets uh, set by uh, the regulators and, and by ourselves as a uh, as a as a world population and community. Yes, self-regulation, of course, is also very important. It is excellent. Thank you for sharing that. And you talked about the Green Deal, of course, decarbonization. Great segue to our next speaker which is Christina, and before we begin, Christina, I just have to say f it's fantastic, not only that we have someone who's a little bit younger, but also a woman on the panel, <laughs> because in my research and discussing, even the shipping industry by themselves have told me many times, eh, we have a reputation of being a little bit more on the older side, male-dominated, very, very conservative, so I think you also represent a little bit of the future of what the shipping industry can be. So I wanted to start off with a question. You are the COO of a startup that focuses on wind propulsion. What has been your experience these past two years, and how is the demand for green solutions, what we were just talking about, uh, how is the demand for green solutions in the maritime sector these days? Uh, what we've seen is a very positive demand uh, shift of uh, green solutions, and I think it's driven by several things. So one of them is consumers realizing throughout the pandemic these two years that shipping is very important and that it has an impact in terms of sustainability of the goods that are transported to them. So they're asking brands to deliver these goods in a more sustainable way, and these brands at the same time are demanding the industry to deliver them in a sustainable way. And then we also have regulations, regulations coming from the IMO, right now starting the EXI, the CII, and then we also have the European Union, like in 2021 in July, setting a draft to add shipping into the ETS, so the emission trading system, mm -hmm. starting in 2023, but regularly going up until 2026. That was the draft. Um, so we're seeing that f regulations are also making the industry really looking forward to install green technologies. But I would say that green technologies don't have to only be sustainable. It's not just about sustainability, but also about an economical impact. So being sustainable means that you are able to reduce your your costs and deliver better results even for your investors yeah and fantastic and how is it in your company these last few months if you could just give us uh, are there more and more calls coming is the interest growing rapidly how's it been this last year or so amazing we didn't expect so many calls from ship owners and uh, the team was not that prepared for so many calls um, <laughs> and as far as regulation comes by even much calls we have and even for new building it's not just about regulations for existing ships but even new builds that uh, will be delivered in the following years, that they are looking forward to install wind propulsion technologies and other devices on board the ship to make it more sustainable. Very good, excellent, thank you very much. 
So we've already heard our opening rounds, a fantastic beginning of our discussion, and I just wanted to point out the title of our press conference is A Race Against Time, the Maritime Industry and the Climate Goal, uh, which means becoming carbon neutral until 2050. And now we're at 2022, which means we only have 28 years left to meet that goal. So I wanted to come back to Martin. Martin, a big challenge is investment strategy, in particular, how to meet social and regulatory targets. The fleet is aging and environmental regulations will need massive investment in the next three decades. Can you tell us more about the so-called technology trio? That would be propulsion, green fuels, and digital, and how this combination is making investment decisions difficult. Uh, well, <laughs> thanks, Peter. I think that, you, you know, you've, you've put it on the table. It's made everything three times as difficult as it should be. I mean, the, um, we're in a position where after 50 years when ships are not that different from, I mean, I, uh, when, I, when I was in shipbuilding in the, in the 1980s, the Panamaxes then were not that much different from the ones that are being delivered. They're a bit bigger. The ones today are 20% bigger, but they're, they're not that much different. Um, but suddenly, everything on the ship is under challenge. The propulsion system, um, because, as Christina said, we're really up against it on meeting the carbon goals. Um, we have a need a new propulsion system. Once you've got a new propulsion system, which also depends on what fuels you've got available, you've got to get the fuel. And the fuel is an even bigger problem than the propulsion system. And then you've got to get the whole thing on the ship working properly. And we're in the middle of the I-4 revolution, uh, digital technology, and you are need, going to need information to integrate, integrate all these new systems to really make them work effectively. And you, I think putting the, th the three together is very difficult. And since we're talking about a, a budget, maybe $3 trillion basic to build ships to expand the fleet and replace the existing one over the next 30 years, there's a lot of money tied up in it. Mm. Um, I, I mean, if I, I could say just a brief word about yeah, it. Yeah, we have an extra minute. Please go ahead. Sure. Um, well, the, 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 the propulsion units, I mean, the diesel has reigned supreme since the late 1940s, and um, it's been enormously successful, and heavy fuel oil has been a, a wonderful source of energy. I mean, it's packed with energy, and there's nothing in, on the green front which is quite as good as heavy fuel oil, except the emissions, you know, that's the problem. Um, it looks as though the internal combustion engine is going to be available um, from the, in a year or two time in multi-fuel basis that will um, uh, th that will burn methanol, ammonia, or hydrogen. I mean, perhaps later, I'm sure newt has got a more updated figure on these, but I'd heard 2024 for the, um, uh, th for the methanol and maybe towards the end of the decade for hydrogen. Ammonia um, has difficulties because you need a, an advanced charge to, 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 to get the combustion to go. Um, so uh, I, I think the you know on the deep sea trades the um, the Im internal combustion engines there for a while to come. Um, the the second alternative is a fuel cell or batteries and the fuel cell burning the same fuels basically um, ammonia, methanol, hydrogen, um, <coughs> and um, uh, the battery combination seems very likely, but that's really, al although fuel cells are well established, um, it's still very embryonic technology in shipping and quite difficult to develop in the deep sea trades. And so um, the, the way, uh, uh, and then the third one, of course, is which is seems to be coming in from the outside. You know, it's like one of these horses that comes running up at the back of the race and um, is, is nuclear, which uh, went very much out of fact. 50 years ago, people assumed we were going to have nuclear ships in future, and that all disappeared thanks to dollar a barrel oil. You know, I mean, why spend a fortune on a nuclear engine when you can get almost free um, car hydrocarbons. Today, the, um, some of the designs, like the, the molten salt design, uh, has uh, being resurrected. You've got the, they don't explode. They, they, they shut down. If things go wrong, they shut down. So it's safer. They're making these things quite small now. So um, I think that um, that one's there, but it's not 
quite on the table yet. It's worth thinking about. Okay. Thank you very much. And I'm sure and any time we mention nuclear, that will raise eyebrows and many taxes. <laughs> so <laughs> we can expand about that maybe a little bit later. Yeah. Before I continue to my next question in our panel, if anyone wants to reply or jump in, you're more than welcome. And I also wanted to do a reminder to our journalists and our viewers, certainly prepare your questions. And oh, I'd say in about 25 minutes, we are very much looking forward to hearing from you so that our distinguished guests here can answer your questions. Oh, could I ask, answer, add on one thing I forgot? Please, briefly, but go uh, ahead. <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, green fuel is going to be very expensive. Green fuel is going to be, well, then I have to just jump in and ask you, because there are two or three words to that. Green fuel is going to be expensive. Yeah, problem, what do you think? Well, it's not a problem. Yeah, the problem is when you look at the, at the problem as a fuel-based approach, but if you look at it, an energy-based approach, there are solutions today. So you have vessel optimization, you have um, energy efficiency, you have then wind proportion. Wind proportion can offer 30 to 40% uh, energy required by the vessel. Yeah. And then if you leave the rest uh, for alternative fuels, then uh, it's much easier to, to achieve. Okay, so it's a challenge, but there might be a few opportunities depending on how we look at it. Okay, excellent, thank you very much. I'd like to come back to Nico. Nico, at the beginning we heard from Martin that the shipping industry has done quite well in the last 12 months. Can you as president-designate of BIMCO tell us how much money will be invested in green solutions? Some say that the ship owners are acting maybe too cautiously. Would you agree with that? Um, no, <laughs> I, 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 I don't think ship owners act uh, too cautiously. I, I think uh, shipping industry may not be the right industry for two cautious people. <laughs> um, I think uh, ship owners act uh, rationally. Um, but talking about the numbers, it's it's very difficult to to give a number. Um, Martin just mentioned three trillion, um, and, and 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 nobody in shipping will challenge a number given by Martin Stopford. So <laughs> I won't either. Um, I cannot judge how much it will be. It will be a lot but it will be a lot less um, than the cost of not moving in the direction of transition. Um, the uh, external costs of using fossil fuels, if we would measure them, the transport today would be much more expensive than the, 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 the price we pay for it. Um, the problem comes in the um, technological complexity. Um, it is much more complex than um, perceived in, 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 in public, but then again, that's what SMM is about. Um, and uh, there we will see the different technologies. So that's uh, good that we are here. Absolutely, fantastic, thank you. Can I ask you, with your company too, when we deal with, the, we're gonna come to digitalization in a moment, but is it difficult to get young, trained engineers these days to hire them? Is, is there enough supply out there? Um, Globally, I cannot judge. I don't have any updated numbers. For our company, as we still employ a reasonable amount of German seafarers, we still have access. Um, okay. Internationally, I hear there is a scarcity forecasted for talent. Okay, so that is internationally still a challenge. Okay, yeah. excellent. Let me turn over to Knut. Knut, when I did some research on you and DNV, I often came across the so-called maritime ren renaissance and your belief in, and I quote you here, a new era that is dawning for the maritime industry and is a surprising catalyst for the positive change ahead. Could you please expand on this a little and let us know why you believe this to be the case? Isn't that a wonderful phrase? It maritime is, maritime renaissance. renaissance. Uh, fantastic. It, it really brings to life a lot of optimism, a lot of innovative capabilities, and also a new start. And, uh, and that is really what a renaissance is all about. It's, uh, it's a rebirth of, of something that can be much better. And um, I think what we, I mean, we heard from Christina the, some of the new solutions that are being looked at. I think we have, through this period of pandemic, really challenged ourselves personally and, and in each other's companies to be more digital, but also to look at things with fresh eyes and really challenge you know, the status quo of how we operate and how we do things. And this, uh, together with the complexities that we talked about previously, I think it sets a, a very nice uh, setting for looking at things in a new way 
bringing in innovative people, looking really at new ways of resolving the challenges that we're up against. And uh, coming back to this issue around attracting talent, if the industry in which you are working is not up against challenges, what's in it for the young people mm. to come and make a difference? And I think there are real challenges ahead and we are still short on solutions. So that, that you know, potential is there for young people to really make a difference. And, and uh, I'm so happy to see that uh, th the maritime industries are really attracting more and more people. And as we will talk about later also, when digitalization is entering, we have this fantastic combination of experience from the seafarers, the people working on shore in the maritime operations in the shipyards but also the young people that master some of the new technologies yeah. and i think that is really you know a fantastic recipe for optimism and a maritime renaissance fantastic thank you and i'll just give you a warning christina since you are one of the younger people on our panels i'll be coming back to you specifically and i want to ask you what really uh, motivates young people to enter the maritime industry or to come work for a company like yours but I'll get to that in a moment. I don't want to jump the order here. <laughs> Martin, if I want to come back to you real quick and let me look at the time here. Yeah, I'd say we still have a good 20 minutes and then we'll get to our questions and answers. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask, talking about the industry's own set goal to become carbon neutral until 2050, just to be clear here, can you tell us the alternative fuels, what alternative fuels will it come down to specifically? Uh, in your okay. opinion. Yes, thanks. I, I'd forgotten about this question. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> they, um, well, there's, there's not that much on offer. It all comes down to things that you can... Uh, there's the wind, of course, um, but that has limitations. I mean, you, uh, and I think as Christina said very clearly, you can only do 30% of the power if you're lucky on certain routes. And you, you get stuck in, if there's no wind, you do need, a, need some power. But the, um, the, the main fuels that are on the table at the moment are methanol, which is a hydrocarbon, but it's green, if it, it's green if you make it, or it's some gr shade of green if, if you make it with something that doesn't use any carbon. In other words, you, you, you steal the carbon out of the atmosphere, put it into the methanol, and mm -hmm. then you burn it, and it comes out again, so it's carbon neutral in that sense. And it behaves if rather like a heavy fuel oil, but it it's has less energy in it, about half the energy of heavy fuel oil. Um, second one is ammonia, which is um, uh, toxic. Uh, it needs to be refrigerated to 70, I think 70 degrees, is it? Uh, 70 30, or 80 degrees? Thir 32. 30 32, is it? Okay. Um, and it's... Um, it has problems of toxicity, which is, is, is an issue. But I think both of methanol and ammonia um, can be burnt in internal combustion engines um, and in fuel cells as well. And the third one I is hydrogen itself, which is, uh, that's minus 240 degrees, isn't it? So it's almost absolute zero. And it's quite difficult to contain. It's not an easy fuel. Mm. Um, but the big thing, I mean, I think the point I'd like to make about these fuels is that um, they really all, with the exception of the wind, bless it, they all go back to um, hydrogen. You know, you capture the hydrogen from the sun or the wind and you turn it in uh, and you then use that to generate the green fuels. And this process is very expensive. I mean, I, I did a, a calculation. I thought it'd be interesting to see how much... Um, it, it would cost to power one of these big container ships, the sort of 23,000 TU container ships. And one, I took one that was delivered last year, which was burning 200 tons a day at 22 knots, which is pretty economical, I would say. And to produce 200 tons a day of um, uh, replacement for heavy fuel oil, you need 400 tons a day of methanol. Mm. And to generate 400 tons of methanol, you'd need uh, 36 10 megawatt offshore uh, wind turbines. And the cost of a, t a, a, of a wind turbine field offshore that size um, is about a billion dollars. 
One billion dollars. Yes, a billion dollars. And, and th this is based, I've got a very detailed listing of the costs. It's a current cost, it may well come down. But, um, and then the offshore, the running cost is about $100,000 a day. Mm. And so you're into some very, very expensive investment for the big ships. But that's not, th th that isn't the end of the story because the trouble is that last year, in 2020, according to BP, the renewables only accounted for 13% of world electricity production, mm. which is growing at 2%. In the last 10 years, the growth of renewables has not even taken up the full expansion of electricity consumption. And as we move one of the major sources of demand for energy, cars, from gasoline to electricity, that's going to grow. So I'd say there's going to be massive competition from the electricity industry, the chemical industry, for these green fuels. And I'm, I don't see that shipping is necessarily going to get, you know, to be at the front of the queue here because it's got to go through the whole bunkering system. Mm. And if you've got four or five fuels, instead of just getting heavy fuel oil or uh, MG, uh, MDO, you know, you, you actually are having to uh, bunker several, you know, refrigerated fuels, LNG, uh, uh, methanol, uh, ammonia, hydrogen. Uh, you've got a much more complex business. So I, I think that um, there's a, this is what worries me most of all, is that the industry, you know, you, and I think it worries the owners. You build the ship and then you wait, you know, and you find you can't afford the fuel. Absolutely. Thank you very much. D D D David, if you want to add I, something real quick, I, please yeah, go ahead. I, 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 I know the, um, the calculation uh, that, that, that you made, uh, which was based on wind, and, and I fully agree, you know, with, the difficulties of today, and let's say the next 15 years, at least in terms of distribution, uh, 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 priority uh, to other uh, forms of, uh, of, of, let's say, uh, transport for electricity, uh, and, and, and therefore alternative fuels, including hydrogen. But if you would make your calculation, which you did on the basis of wind, which I think is not a very efficient way to trans you know, to transform, uh, 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 you know, energy to, to electricity. If you would do the same with uh, solar, and let's assume, you know, in 20 years, you know, all of the desert in Saudi Arabia or Northern Africa is, you know, we have solar, solar cells, solar panels, and we are producing electricity and we convert that electricity into, uh, into hydrogen in whatever form and then use that as a, as a base for all these alternative fuels that you just mentioned, which I believe, I 100% concur that there is going to be not only one alternative, but it's going to be uh, different ones for different applications. I just got the notice we are running a little bit tight on time. If you okay, want to ask well a quick question. No, the, qu the question is, what, did, what happens if you do the, the, your calculation on the base of solar in 25 years' time? Oh, and Martin, I'd ask you also two sentences. We have to keep it short because uh, uh, we're running. Well, that's two seconds now. gone now, Peter. <laughs> I, I'll give you a few extra seconds, but please they, keep it short. Um, well, I, I, of course, you're absolutely right. You, the cost, if you redid it with solar, it would be about half the price uh, with today's. And in fact, the, at the moment, the current range of conventional solar panels are, are getting about 22% of the sunlight, but there are some very interesting development projects who will get up to 30%. They're not, not immediately. What, what struck me so much is how small these projects yep. are, you know. And I'd ask for the final thought, is that? Um, I've, I've run out of thoughts now. You've run out of thoughts, okay. <laughs> Again, I do apologize, that's just because of our, our, our time constraints. As I said, in preparing, we could literally speak for hours and it's fantastic. <laughs> Let me jump over real quick, Christina. Talking about alternative fuels, there's something else we haven't discussed yet. Please tell us a little bit about your solution for the industry. What are the advantages of wind propulsion systems? Precisely, I think that we've mentioned a lot of disadvantages for fuel, for renewable fuels, and wind precisely has the advantages the same way. So um, on one side, it's free, and it will always be free. You have it there. Um, and then you also have, like, um, I mean, you don't need to to really invest in infrastructure. We were mentioning three trillion US dollars. The Global Maritime Forum said that it was between one to 1.4 trillion if ammonia was adopted. So 
we, we can range from that to there. I mean, like more optimistic or more pessimistic maybe, but that's a lot of money. But wind, you don't need to build this infrastructure in land and neither on board the vessel. So you don't need this retrofit inside. Um, and that is also something very good for us. And then you also have another thing that it's a price volatility. So wind, as it's free, it, it's not owned by any government, by any place. Uh, you don't have dependency and then you don't have these geopolitical risks too. Mm. And then you also have um, another thing that's uh, very good about wind, it's renewable, and it's the best efficient way to use it is directly from the vessel. So for those vessels that are navigating in good weather conditions, as Martin said, you can just use it directly because if you go to solar or if you go to wind, you have loss of efficiency and then transportation and, and you get a problem also with sustainability. Efficiency mm -hmm. has to do with sustainability. So precisely all the disadvantages that alternative fuels have we, with the wind propulsion, we can turn them back into advantages. Sure. I'm sure it's a great sales pitch, too. You start off with, hey, wind is free. That should get people's attention. Yeah, <laughs> it's free. Why, why not use it? Yeah, absolutely. Good. Thank you. D David, yeah. would, would you allow to make me a short statement in support of what Christina just absolutely. said? Absolutely. Short statement you know, support is absolutely fine. We are only talk about decarbonization by finding new fuels. But what is really spectacular is the developments that Christina is talking about. But there are all sorts <coughs> of other developments in reducing fuel consumption. Think about uh, weather routing, uh, better propellers, better uh, uh, rudders that really contribute to the, the decrease in use of fuel. And we're not talking about a few percent. We talk about 10, 15, 20, 25 percent that's a major compared, to, compared to 20 years ago. So the that's the there. These uh, alternative fuels are finite. So if we're able to do it in an efficient way, these finite alternative fuels can be used to decarbonize more part of the fleet. Mm. So that's more clever. Excellent. Good. Thank you very much. Let me come back to Nico. Nico, your, your fleet, amongst others, consists of car carriers. The oldest uh, is about 13 years old. Could you imagine investing in a wind-powered vessel, like the project from Valnius Wilhelmsen started, as something like a comeback of your company's tradition? And if Christina wants to add something to that, feel free. Please go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you. I'm, I'm here for BIMCO, not, not for lies. But, but to answer your question in, in any case, when you say a comeback for our company, you referred to the flying P-liners 100 years ago. Martin knows the story well, bringing Salpeter nitrate, which in fact is ammonia, um, from South America to Europe with Windcraft. Um, and yes, I can of course imagine that one day uh, we invest in that technology because there is no more direct way than turning wind power into forward movement. movement. Christina is absolutely right. Uh, of course, the vast majority of wind power will be used via the windmills, via hydrogen, via ammonia. There, I don't agree with Martin. You, you say methanol, I, I say ammonia, because methanol is with C. Um, ammonia is w without, and, and, and it's toxic and it's smelling, I agree. It's more smelling than it is toxic. So you detect the slightest leakage, and, and, and we have 30 years experience with ammonia. Coming back to wind. Um, I think it will increase efficiency of energy efficiency of any vessel, either by big sails or by alternative use of, of wind. Uh, in a nutshell, to answer your question, yes, I can imagine investing in wind. And Christina, we will speak about it. Very good. Christina, would you like to add something to that, please? No, precisely. Coming back to the first question, what are the changes? So these changes come since the first time we started in 2014. It would be unimaginable to ha be all together here and really agreeing everyone that wind will be something part of the future. So very happy to see that this is happening today and uh, <coughs> happy that it's being here at, SM at the SMM. So could, could, could I just make a, a comment? I back to me one sentence. Okay. Because I already have to throw out one or two questions. <laughs> time, I'll give you one sentence. Oh, okay, well, it seems to me, I agree with you about your ships, but they were quite small ships, so 3,000 tons. We move 12 billion tons of cargo today, and where you start from is how do you move 12 billion tons of cargo without using, uh, producing any emissions? And that, I think, is where wind starts to, you know, you start to wonder whether wind can really do that. Yeah, that's Quick exactly response. why I said, that's exactly why I said it will improve energy and efficiency. I don't see pure sailing yeah. ships. I see yeah. energy efficiency of ships improved by using wind. In terms of market, like around 80% of the global fleet could benefit from this type of solutions. Yeah. If you go to 
to root by root, then it's around 65 cent per cent. And then you also obviously it's not about uh, only solely wind propulsion, but alternate so co-propulsion sure. with the main engine. Sure. And I'll jump in there. And I, I have to say, this is where it kind of gets exciting because we see what we talk about at the SMM when people come back together after four long years. It really is a taste of the discussions that we are looking forward to. I want to jump over to Bernd. Bernd, the light motif of SMM is driving the maritime transition. In what way do you accompany the industry on its way to becoming climate neutral until 2050, <coughs> please? Well, SMM is, is a platform, is an, a platform for the industry to present their products. And as Rene uh, just said, there's a lot that can be done in, in terms of uh, efficiency uh, by, by technology. And that is shown at SMM by roughly 2,000 uh, exhibitors. So that's one of our main functions. And besides that, um, uh, 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 an exhibition like SMM is also a mirror reflecting the state of the industry and perhaps looking a little bit into the future. So by setting up a couple of conferences, networking um, events and so on, we also try to, to further support the issue, like the Maritime Environmental Congress, Christina will be will be a speaker uh, uh, also there. So we can we can discuss that or give the forum for a discussion how to um, lead the way or how the way to to 2050 may be may be easier and, and may be reached. So that's basically the function of, of the exhibition. And best thing is that SMM is back again. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> After four years, we're excited. We're going to get to our questions and answers from our journalists in a moment, but I wanted to have a quick look into digitalization, and I wanted to talk also about the costs of digitalization. I'll turn back to Knut. Knut, talking about digitalization, in your opinion, how can it lead to an increase in efficiency and also greener shipping? Now, that's a, a very good question. So, um, uh, Martin mentioned that the green fuels will be expensive, but all fuels will be expensive. And that's where energy efficiency was mentioned as one of the really focus areas by both Nico and, and Rene. And I think this is where digitalization really has a role to play on the vessels, on the systems. There's so much that can be improved still. Mm. But then we could also talk about the whole logistic chains, how to optimize to arrive in time, not having to wait outside the port, etc. So there, there are really opportunities beyond the technology aspect, more on the logistic aspects. And then maybe coming back to decarbonization, uh, it is so important now for, for the, not only the ship owners, but also those that are chartering vessels and, and sending their or shipping their products to show that the emission is being reduced, that mm. the carbon emission performance is improved. And that's where also digitalization can help a lot. We can know exactly how much is emitted, uh, the distances traveled, and how that can be improved year by year. And that goes directly for the ship owners, but also for those, say, on the a customer side of the ship owners that due to the scope three emissions have also to report on the emissions. <coughs> so yeah. the whole ESG revolution is also pushing uh, digitalization and further efficiencies, uh, not only on the ship itself, but also on the whole ecosystem around shipping and maritime transport. Great, let me continue straight on then to Nico. Nico, as we all know, shipping has a long tradition and sometimes change comes difficult for the industry. What does the situation look like today in 2022 as we talk about digitalization in the shipping market? Well, the, the, the uh, low hanging fruits, so to say, of digitalization. I, I think Knut mentioned them. There, there, there will be sensor technology. There will be uh, uh, plant maintenance improvement. We have all this information from the ships, uh, weather routing, uh, voyage planning. That's, that's one area. Uh, which I think is extremely interesting. The other area, and, and, and that I quickly want to mention, is uh, the way we work, the way we charter ships, the way we negotiate ships, contracts. Uh, BIMCO is the leading institute for documentation and contract phrasing and, 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 and contract publication. Um, imagine smart contracts, imagine ship brokers getting answers proposed by the computer as a fair compromise between the two comp uh, positions of the negotiating parties. Mm -hmm. Imagine the computer saying, 
the right average market level for this in this expense spare parts is X amount of dollars. We have all that information. We will have smart uh, uh, contracts. And that will be really exciting if you think remote office, people seeing while they negotiate what other people do. Uh, mm -hmm. their, their, their BIMP role will play a big role. Excellent points. Thank you very much. Let's continue. I look at the clock here. We have about 10 more minutes about for our Q&A. Still have two or three quick questions, and then we'll move on. Um, Renee, how, how willing do you think ship owners are to invest in digital solutions? And in which areas should they be more involved, in your opinion? Well, uh, listening to Knut and, uh, and Nico, for me, digitalization is an absolute no-brainer. You know, it is going to happen. Uh, I, I like to look always at the automotive industry as sort of a, a beacon for what's happening in our in the maritime industry. The maritime industry certainly is not the most advanced in the world in terms of technology and adaption and, and, accept and acceptance of, of new things, but, but digitalization is, is uh, you know, it's, it's clear. It's there, it's going to happen, uh, and I think uh, uh, both Knut and Nico already gave you the reasons why. Um, our industry um, is a little bit different than the automotive industry in the sense that, you know, it's a fragmented industry. There are thousands of shipyards, there are 10,000 of suppliers. So finding a standard, finding a platform on which you can build digitalization is kind of difficult. Mm. Now, the good news is that, you know, digitalization becomes more and more easy as time progresses. You know, it can be done by smaller companies, it can be done inside organizations, either being ship owners or equipment suppliers or shipyards. Give you an example, you know, in, my, in the company I used to work for, Diamond Shipyards, we are digitalizing every year more than 100 ships, completely digitalized. So it can be done, you know, it's there. It's the, the, the question is, you know, uh, at what speed are we going to do it? Well, it's going to happen for sure. Okay, it's inevitable. Absolutely. Understood. <laughs> Brent, I'll come back to you. I wanted to add one point here. So although many processes are being digitalized to increase um, efficiency or safety, the human capital, as we all know, is still very important. Many industries are looking for talent, technical engineers, and young entrepreneurs with ideas. So how does SMM support the maritime sector to get people on board? And maybe you could also mention a little bit about the maritime career, career market. Well, that's exactly what, what we are doing. Uh, we, we started a couple of years ago because the struggle for talents and for new people and young people entering uh, this industry uh, is, is, a, is facing and, and, and uh, conflicting and necessary for, uh, to, so to help, this, help this for every um, one, not only the maritime industry. So what we did was set up the maritime career market, which is uh, an area, so to say, where um, companies, uh, exhibitors can uh, present themselves to students, to pupils, to, to uh, young technicians, to talk to, uh, with them about um, their career opportunities and so on and so on. We're doing this with a couple of partners and we hope that this is one way, uh, first of all, to give an attractive platform for the industry, that they offer brilliant jobs and also to attract more and more young people, especially for these engineering and technical profession. That's uh, that's what what we try to do, and that will be again uh, in uh, at SMM. Outstanding. And as we talk about young people, Christina, I wanted to come back to what we mentioned a little bit earlier. How do you manage to get people into your company? Tech engineers are certainly high in demand these days. Uh, precisely what Kanut said before, digitalization uh, is something that young talent wants to be involved in. And uh, young talent wants to be involved in those places where there are challenges to be solved. And I think that the maritime industry is a very good place for us to innovate. And that's because I'm coming from the aeronautical industry and each time you want to innovate it takes like 10 years to be ready to implement. That's because it's coming from uh, public entities, the regulations, but now we have private entities that are able to put these regulations pl on place much easier than we have the industry willing to adopt this innovation. And throughout a lot of years, there's no, no there has not been uh, a, v uh, a lot of innovation in the industry. So everything that we've seen in the automotive industry, like Renee mentioned before, we have autonomous cars. Maybe in the future, this can be also in shipping. And that's something that the young talent is looking at. If I've done this in the automotive, automotive industry and there's 
nothing more for me right now, which is not really true in this sense, but why shouldn't we move to the shipping? There is a business opportunity here, and that's going to make a lot of industries enter. In my case, I'm an aeronautical engineer. I'm entering with this knowledge because it's needed for the wind proportion. It's not just about maritime engineers. Uh, it's about much more. Excellent. And, you know, earlier Nico had said that here in Germany, it's, it's pretty good as far as supply for getting young people or engineers into the shipping industry. But in your experience, you're now in Spain. Is there anything that the industry in general could do to make it more appealing for young people to enter this branch? I believe it's about the projects. Uh, I've, we've seen a huge wave of startups in the industry, even the, the M&A uh, of, of these companies is booming right now in the industry. It's making uh, VCs entering, which is moving the industry much more in terms of innovation. And in our case, the talent is moving elsewhere. So it's not just about being in Spain. We have people from France, from Italy, from the US. Uh, we've got people also in the past from Germany. So, so I mean, it's, it's not about uh, where, where is its talent or where is it being developed, but I think Europe is the place for innovation in the maritime industry, and even ship owners are looking for this innovation here. So it's a very good way to, to really start the business. And incumbent companies and more established ones can, can really benefit from younger companies, which are much more agile to innovate, and, and thus really drive this innovation throughout the whole industry. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing your thoughts on that. So now it's time to take a small look back. As many of you may know, this time, this year in September, the SMM will have its 30th edition. And that's a lot of history. And so I wanted to come to you, Bernd, because there's an old expression we say in the US, there's no love like the first love or no time like the first time. If you could maybe share a few words about your very first SMM and when it was and your impressions about that. Well, SMM uh, started in the early 60s as a, as a regional show here in, in Hamburg, done by the Hamburg ship uh, engineers, shipbuilding engineers. Uh, my first SMM was in 2004. Um, it was fascinating for me because this kind of technology, everybody and myself uh, thought it's a somehow a steel, uh, uh, how should I say, the steel, uh, Producing production, yeah, yeah, uh, kind <coughs> of industry. But even at that time, uh, it, 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 it was very clear there's so much technology uh, driving the ships, uh, managing the ships, and so on and so on. And that's this has continued over all the years. So it's it's uh, it's it's difficult to say what was my most uh, impressive idea about SMM. What I think is uh, is is uh, the the important message from my side. We have seen a couple of. Uh, shipping crises since the 60s and ups and downs. And uh, I remember the, the crisis of 2008 and 2009, and we have were so uh, worried altogether uh, how would this would reflect on uh, uh, SMM. But through all these years, SMM, every year, pre-pandemic times at least, uh, it grew and grew and grew, and we got uh, we got more discussions, new uh, new groups, new 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 customers coming in, and this this is the strength of SMM to really uh, uh, tackle the the the, 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 the topics uh, which are to be discussed, and that's uh, what's what's a fascinating factor on SMM uh, on my, uh, in my belief. Fantastic, and now after four years, of course, uh, in the meantime, we did have the SMM Digital, which was was excellent, but I think there there's no substitute for being in person with thousands of delegates from the shipping and maritime industry exchanging ideas and also having maybe a nice German beer uh, in the evenings. That's also very important for some people. Absolutely. And uh, I, I think that all belongs to the SMM experience. And with that then, I'd like to ask, maybe I'll start with, with Martin, just briefly and we'll go down, th down the line here. After four years, if I can probably say SMM is back and maybe some of your hopes and expectations for the upcoming SMM this September here in Hamburg. Well, I think, uh, Peter, if I was, uh, if I was in the, the field as a, an equipment supplier or a shipbuilder, because I, I'd be uh, thinking about um, cooperation. One of the things that McKinsey said were in, not about shipping, but about the, uh, making the I-4 revolution work on, on, in land industry, is that you can't do it on your own. You need, you need to, to, to get some some people to test ideas on. In other words, you take a discussion like this and you turn it into something substantial, but with different players. So I'd, I'd be looking, I think I'd be looking for partners that I might work with on some of the new products that I would want to have in the market in five, six years time, you know. Excellent, thank you very much. 
Christina, hopes and expectations for the upcoming SMM. So for me, environmental changes come from discussions, and I think that the industry for a long time, because of not having the SMM and the pandemic, has not uh, engaged all together to have these huge discussions relating to, to the environmental issues. I hope this conversation today that we all had together is really the ignite for much more conversations in, in September. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Quick reminder to our viewers, I have heard we do have a few questions, but you certainly still have a chance to submit your questions, and we'll have a brief Q&A period when we conclude here. We still have a few minutes left. Renee, hopes and <coughs> expectations for the upcoming SMM, please. Um, well, let me say this. Um, we were able to maintain, during the pandemic, we were, we were able to maintain our relation with the people that we know. But it was being very difficult to, you know, to start a conversation and, and to start a relationship with, with the people that you don't know. And this is exactly what will happen uh, in, in the SMM reinforce existing relationships, but very much explore the new ones. Mm, very good, thank you very much. Knut, hopes and expectations, please. Yeah, I'm just so fed up of sitting behind the screen <laughs> all day and, and <laughs> working on Teams and Zoom and whatnot. So just to come out and, and meet people like Rene says and, and reinforce existing relationships. But you, you know who you know, right? But you don't know who you don't know. So true. And that is, you know, where SMM, as one of the premier um, places in, in the maritime calendar, can really offer a lot of, of grounds for, for meeting new people, like, just like Rene said. So, Absolutely. you know, let's turn off the screen, let's unmute in real life <laughs> and get connected again. <laughs> turn off the virtual and come back to the real life. <laughs> exactly. I like that. Very good. Nico, please, for you, your well, hopes and expectations. W what is there to add? Uh, <laughs> in, 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 in one sentence, I would like to get more clarity on what is technic technologically feasible, implementable, and uh, practical. The, the aim is clear, the path is not. Um, and, and, and I also believe that there will not be a one-fits-all solution. So there, SMM is perfectly positioned to show us what is on offer. That's what I expect from it. And I agree with Knut, meeting friends again <laughs> will be the better part of it. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Nico. Yeah, I think I have to come back to Bernd. I mean, you shared with us your, your first SMM. How about now, after four years, what are your hopes and expectations for your show, for the SMM? Mm. Well, uh, the expectations, of course, uh, is uh, the main expect expectation is that the halls will be full again, not just for quantity reasons, but to bring all the, the industry back. Uh, um, the exhibitors and the visitors, the scientists. Um, so getting back to this, to this platform uh, idea that SMM proves as a major exhibition in the industry is uh, the meeting place where we want to meet in person. Yeah, uh, as Knut said, um, let's have a drink uh, in the evening. Let's talk. Um, uh, let's talk. That's also very important. You cannot do this while sitting in front of your monitor. So uh, this is for us the the basic uh, expectation. And taking uh, a look at the at the statistics, uh, we have now 2,000 plus uh, exhibitors registered. Uh, there's still half a year to go. We. Uh, last time we had, uh, before the pandemic, it was 2,200 roughly. So that is a very, very good and positive sign that the industry is confident. SMM is the platform, meeting is the proper place, uh, is the pro proper thing uh, to discuss the industry's issues. And if we fulfill that, then I'm happy, our team is happy, and hopefully the industry as well. Fantastic, outstanding, thank you very much. Thank you. Now, I've just been handed here a, uh, a, a tablet and if this works correctly, it should be that I will be having some questions from our journalists and viewers. And I already see a few coming up. Thank you very much to our technical team. And let me start off. The first one is directed directly at Martin. So Martin, I'd like to read this here. Um, this is from the Hamburger Abendblatt, our local newspaper. Um, Mr. Aufteheider, oh, excuse me, uh, Martin Knopp, Hamburger Abendblatt. Mr. Aufteheider, do you expect a negative impact by the Ukraine war on the SMM? Less visitors, less exhibitors. Maybe I'll start with Martin, also go over to, to Bernd. Well, I think that probably is yours, isn't it? Yeah, you want to take a shot? Go ahead then. <laughs> All right. Um, well, it, it will have uh, an impact, uh, of course, uh, because we, are, uh, we, are, we have the policy of, of not um, ad admission, uh, admitting um, Russian and um, Belarusian exhibitors. On the other hand, it was a percentage of 1.6 of the total exhibitorship uh, before 
before the pandemic. So it's it's a handful. Um, uh, it will not, uh, I think, will not be felt uh, in, in the exhibition. But for us, it's a question of, of the, the principle behind it. We will not uh, let, let uh, Russian companies uh, into the SMM. Uh, so it will be a minor impact, perhaps. Very good. And I'd like to just clarify, that was my mistake. So the way we have it here is that we have the reporter, that says it, and that mm -hmm. person's name is also Martin. Sorry for the confusion yeah. there. That was Martin Kopp from the Hamburger Abendblatt. So it wasn't directed at you, <laughs> <laughs> so we're safe on that. Um, good, we have the next one from the reporter, and that is from uh, Wilhelm Diniet from the Dutch Maritime Weekly, Schutever, hopefully I'm saying that okay. Same question here, and in your reaction, please add the pandemic. Uh, so as you mentioned, 2,000 exhibitors, could it be uh, that there were 2,240 mm -hmm. last time? This is a question about the comparison to the last time and how the pandemic maybe has affected the numbers this time. That's right. Um, there, there was, it was 2,200 something, 40. Uh, now we are 2,000 plus. Uh, we do have, uh, we, we lost a, a group of exhibitors from China because they're simply not uh, allowed to, to, to travel. Uh, they cannot show their products here. So uh, we, we have basically just a handful, two handful or so of Chinese exhibitors. Uh, that's the pandemic uh, impact. But overall, uh, taking this perspective that we want to really be the prime technological platform, uh, I think the, uh, all the, the other exhibitors that will be there, all the companies that will be there, will show that, that our, our expectation of being this yeah, leading platform will be, will be supported. Okay, good, thank you very much. Our next question is com uh, coming from Paul Bartlett from the Sea Trade Maritime News. The question for Martin Stopford, and this one is for you, Martin. Um, green fuels need to be made with renewable energy. Have you done any work on the volumes of renewable energy that will be required for the new fuels and whether there is any scope to produce enough? Uh, well, thanks, um, thanks for that question. It's, um, I, I've looked as carefully as I can at the sort of plans in a in way for, for new, um, uh, solar and um, uh, picking up Rennie's point and the, um, the wind <laughs> plants. And it strikes me that the, the volume is not that great. It's quite slow. The, the project, you know, a big project would only power a few ships. And um, the, uh, uh, whilst I totally take Rennie's point about the... Um, uh, the, 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 the solar in Africa, etc. And I, I did actually work out with a colleague, I think from memory, it would take about 180 kilometers square to run the fleet in the middle of the Sahara, if you know what I mean. But then a lot of the places, y you've got to have somewhere secure to put your investment. And I mean, it would be great if all the sunny spots turned into solar parks but there are investment issues over this. And so I, I think that to, to answer um, Paul Bartlett's question, I, the, the, the digging I've done into the project suggests that either if there is a big project going ahead, it's quite likely to be aimed at something like um, fertilizer plants, for example, the Pilbara you know, in, in, in Australia, those some of the big plants are actually, Yara's plants are linked into fertilizer factories and the others, I think there will be so many people chasing this stuff. Uh, my impression is that you'll have to get in very early uh, in order to get, a, to get a contract. That's my sense. Super. And I'd like to ask Martin to you, and maybe to anyone on the panel, one final question dealing with the 2050 initiative. What do you think, if we could have a wishing well, is the most important thing that really needs to happen to meet the goal of 2050? Well, of course, we could meet the goal of tw 2050 very reliably. I mean, all you've got to do is what uh, Mr. Schuess's company used to do. You trade at seven knots. Mm. I mean, the good old, those wonderful <coughs> tall ships. I've, I've got the, the voyage pattern from Australia to Northwest Europe, and it averaged, it went along the roaring 40s up the, north, up the Atlantic and averaged 6.8 knots. And Averaged. There was no heating on the ship at all, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so I, I think we we I, we haven't mentioned speed o at all. But the one way that we can massively cut our um, fuel consumption, our use of uh, emissions, is by slowing down. But it's just not popular. People say we can't afford it. Uh, I don't know why. 
but uh, and of course, if you did slow down, you'd need twice as many ships. So this is this is wonderful news for the shipbuilding industry, you know. <laughs> Excellent. We have one last minute. Would anyone like to reply to that, respond, or add anything else? The the only thing I can add is that there were no heating on the sailing ships, but there was a stove in the bakery. So there was a chance to heat up a little bit. This is very yeah. true. Actually, the I think the one I saw of your ships, uh, the, the, the Pomerne, it had, um, it had a little stove in the master's cabin as well. As well, yeah. <laughs> Excellent point. Knut, please. No, uh, if I could just add one point to, to all of this. I think um, if you look broadly at it, the, the, the shipping industry and the equipment manufacturers, that's not really where the challenge lies. The challenge really lies in producing sufficient amounts of the better fuels, distribute them, have mm. them available in the ports. And that is something that really requires another kind of effort than just the shipping community coming together. That's really uh, encouraging public, private partnerships, incentives from governments, developing more renewable power plants, and that is a massive undertaking, and that needs to happen. Yeah. I, I, could I, I can just, oh, uh, sorry, please I go ahead. Sure. Martin that's a, but that's a great lead in. I'd just, I'd like to finish it off by saying we need the charters back in the business with deep pockets, ready and willing to pay large amounts of money for green ships, which they used to be. I mean, you know, 50 years ago, the oil companies ran the tanker business they could come back, but at the moment, the, it's all being left to the ship owners, and I think it, that's, well, look, I've said enough. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, to, I, I find it extremely interesting what you just said, Martin, because where are the, why are the oil majors being completely excluded from this conversation? They're the ones that have technology, uh, power, and money to really set up what Knut was saying, which is distribution, which I believe is a key element of of the future success of alternative fuels. Martin, I'll let you answer that, and then I'd like to have Nico have the last word. Please Well, I could say this. I can think of two companies that have done a really, shipping companies, that have done a really good job of getting the digital stuff to work, and it's not easy. I mean, uh, and they were both the shipping departments of oil companies. They've got the, res just like you say, they've got the depth, the resources, and the corporate approach to do <coughs> these things. You know, it's hard to do it when you've got 10 people in the office, exactly. and, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nico, please. Well, just, just to put it into perspective, I, I see the uh, 2050 decarbonization as, as achievable. Uh, you need about 100 megawatt wind or solar power to produce 70,000 tons of ammonia fuel via hydrogen, of course. Um, now, the, 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 the energy efficiency of ammonia Knut knows this much better, but it's about half of normal uh, uh, diesel. Um, so you would produce the equivalent of 35,000 tons of uh, marine fuel with 100 megawatt. And that gives you the chance to kind of guesstimate in which area this has to be built. And, and there is capacity growing. You have uh, Namibia, you have Chile, you have South Africa, you have Australia, you have the Middle East. You have the oil countries. So, yes, let's stay optimistic. Excellent. And I think that's an excellent closing word. Uh, yeah, you get a, a feel, a taste of all kinds of discussions and themes that will be discussed about at our upcoming SMM. I want to, first of all, take a moment to thank our speakers. I know we're in the studio here streaming, but I still, uh, out of tradition, like to give everyone an applause. <laughs> thank you all very much yeah. for an excellent talk. <laughs> yeah, and in addition to that, um, I want to thank our technical crew here. And of course, the entire SMM team. And thank you to all the journalists and guests that joined us online today. Please don't hesitate to direct further questions to Nora Hirschfield, press officer at the SMM. And of course, you can find all kinds of updated information at the SMM homepage. I wish you a great and successful rest of the day. And of course, the most important thing, please stay healthy and safe. The team of SMM is certainly looking forward to welcoming you to Hamburg from September 6th to the 9th. And as we say in Germany, see you again. Auf Wiedersehen. <laughs>